Hello and welcome to Sake Revolution, America's first sake podcast. I'm your host, John Puma from the SakeNotes.com, also the administrator of the internet, Sake Discord, and an all-around sake nerd. And I'm your host, Timothy Sullivan. I'm a sake samurai, sake educator, as well as the founder of the Urban Sake website. And together, John and I will be tasting and chatting about all things sake and doing our very best to make it fun and easy to understand. So, John, do you know what I've been doing a lot of recently? Uh, I, you have not been grilling on the fire escape, right? That's <laughs> no. something we talked about and, you, and decided that would be a bad idea. No. I've been planning out imaginary itineraries to Japan. <laughs> we cannot go to Japan right now because of no. international travel restrictions. And I miss Japan so much. I really do too. And this is actually kind of embarrassing, but my wife and I do the same thing, <laughs> but we actually like make spreadsheets and be like, okay, we're, well, this date, we're going to be here and then we're going to do this. And it, yeah. It's how we're getting through. It's, this is how we're doing it. It's a healthy crutch. Well, traveling in Japan is just so much fun. It is. Yeah. I love the bullet train. It's so easy to get around and you can get from one place to the next very quickly and it's comfortable and clean and oh, it's just so great. And you can drink on the train, which is great too. Drinking sake, of course. Oh, absolutely. You can get a little bento box and get your cup sake and oh, it's fantastic. Now I want to go even more. Thanks a lot, John. <laughs> well, you brought this up. This isn't my <laughs> fault. <laughs> so what prefectures have you visited in Japan? Well, most recently, I think we talked about this on the show, we went to Hokkaido and Yamagata mm -hmm. and then over to Tokyo. Because I like to always end my trip with a nice week or so in Tokyo. But I do want to get out and see other parts of the country. And this was the first time that we ever went north. Like, I've never gone anywhere. I went to Sendai once for like one afternoon, but I'd never done like a, a multi-day trip north of, of Tokyo. It was really interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting places in the north. Have you been to Iwate? No, I actually have not. Mm. What yeah. about one of my favorite places? What about Akita? That is on the list. Akita is right. going to happen. The next time we go north, and it's going to be, it needs to be in the wintertime because I want to experience all that snow. But it's going to happen. Well, Akita is an amazing place. Let's talk about it a little bit. I have been there. I've done a few tours through Akita, visiting some different sake breweries. Mm -hmm. And if there's two things that people in Akita are proud of, one is their sake and one uh -huh. is their rice. Yeah. I think that when Chizuko was on the show, she was telling us how proud of the local rice that they are and how growing up that was something that was ingrained in her. Yeah. Chizuko's from Akita. That's her home prefecture. And I really learned a lot about Akita from her. They have a very famous food from Akita. What's that? It's called Iburigako. And it is smoked daikon pickle. What? <laughs> <laughs> you know daikon, right? I, I Yes. Now, number one, I have not heard of this. Just <laughs> clear the air. Because <laughs> you asked if I'd heard of it. So, No. Daikon, so it's a pickled radish. Well, have you ever gotten Japanese food and there are these little yellow crunchy bits of daikon on the side? Yes. Yeah, those little yellow things, that is daikon pickle. So it's they take a daikon radish okay. and they pickle it and it turns kind of a yellowish color. Sure. And what they do in Akita is they take those pickled daikons whole, like big long ones, sure. and they put it in a hut and they light smoke and they smoke it for several days and the outer layers become darker in color and smoky and the smoke permeates the entire pickle and then they slice it up and they serve it as an otsumami or as a sake appetizer and it sounds crazy but i'm telling you yes it does sound very crazy it is delicious and one way that chizuko taught me to eat Iburigako was by putting some cheese on it. 
So you have the little daikon pickle that's smoked, and you put a little piece of a camembert cheese or a brie cheese, a creamy cheese, and eat mm-hmm. it. Oh, my God, it's so good. And it pairs beautifully with sake. Oh. Now, you, you've seen it. It, you, it sounds to me like you're getting a little nostalgic for this food. <laughs> Is this? Can you get this locally? Is this like a thing you can that any place in New York makes? Nobody here makes it. Oh. But well. I have had it here in New York. It has to be specially imported from Akita. All right. Well, if you travel to Akita and you go to the different train stations, it's like the number one thing that people want from Akita. So all the gift shops and souvenir shops have pickled, smoked daikon ready to go. (laughs) That is, I would never have thought of pickling i mean i wouldn't have thought of pickling it but i certainly wouldn't have thought would have thought of of smoking a pickle that's it or smoking smoking a pickled uh product yeah and oh. chisico told me that she had like a special connection a friend of her second cousin knows this little old lady who makes the best smoked pickles and she does it in this a uh, little hut and you know she's on a l- waiting list to get the smoked pickles from this <laughs> there's a smoked pickle waiting list <laughs> Yes. Because, of course, there is. <laughs> <laughs> All well, right. We don't have any to taste today, but trust me, it's amazing. <laughs> and if you ever see anything on a Japanese food menu about iburigako or smoked daikon pickle, you have to try it. It's amazing with sake. I have to. You have All to. All right. This is a command from the sake samurai. Yes. All right. So where is Akita located? Well... It looks like I just missed it. It's just north of Yamagata. If I would have aimed a little bit higher, <laughs> I would have accidentally ended up there and been very surprised. But yeah, it's, it looks like it's nestled nicely between Yamagata and it looks like Aomori on, above, uh, to the north. That's right. It is in the far north of Honshu, or the main island of Japan, but it's on the Sea of Japan side. So on the Sea of Japan, there's Niigata, which... I'm familiar with. There's Yamagata above that, which you're familiar Mm -hmm. with. And on top of both of those prefectures is Akita. So it is very far north and it is on the Sea of Japan, not the Pacific side of the island. Mm -hmm. It's a relatively small prefecture and it is very well known for agriculture as well. So there's not a lot of developed industry. There's a lot of farmland and a lot of agriculture. So that's why the rice plays such an out, outsized role in everyone's life there, I think, because they're really proud of their farming and their rice. And when you have a place that's proud of their rice, you're going to have a place that's proud of their sake, I'm assuming. Yes. Did you know that they even have a term to say how proud they are of their sake? It's called bishu o koku. Which yeah. means okay, which means country of beautiful sake. All right, they're kind of that's a they're not holding back. Giving themselves, no, that right is out. not that is not humble. <laughs> they are putting it right out there. <laughs> that is not a humble brag. That is that is very overt. <laughs> <laughs> the country of beautiful sake, and there are about thirty-seven active sake breweries in Akita right now. But it's one of the top producing prefectures as far as volume goes. Uh, I don't know if we get a ton of sake from there, a ton of those, you know, of that massive amount. But whenever I'm in Japan, a lot of the trend setting, the hip sakes are often from there. Mm. And I always find that to be very interesting. And it makes me, it always makes me curious about going to Akita one of these days. Yeah. But again, just it just hasn't had the opportunity yet. Well, we're going to put it on both of our imaginary itineraries for our next imaginary trip to Japan. And then we can have our imaginary on-location Sake Revolution episode (laughs) from Akita. As we always say, as soon as we can travel again, as soon as we can get together again, we're going to take our microphones here, there, and everywhere. But Akita is definitely high on the list. Yeah, very much so. So when you went over there, did you actually take the Shinkansen up or over, or did you fly in? Nope. I very rarely fly domestically inside Japan because I love the bullet train so much. (laughs) So I took the bullet train when I went to Akita and I was there in the winter. And let me tell you, that's the best time. It is a snowy place. So the Uh, snow is very deep. 
And uh, it's very picturesque place, lots of mountains mm -hmm. and uh, very beautiful, really good food, really good rice. Ooh, I'm uh, getting a little jealous here. <laughs> That's interesting that you usually take the train. I actually find myself taking domestic flights very often. And really? that's mostly just because it's a, sometimes a little bit quicker. And the experience of flying in Japan is very different from the experience of flying in America in that you're through security in moments. They don't really mind if you have drinks on you. Uh, even if they are in open beverages there, they just slap a sticker on it. They move it to the other side of, of the security barricade and you go through and then they hand it back to you when you're done. And there, and then you're, and then you can bring it on the plane with you. It's not even a, uh, it's not even a concern. So yeah, that's interesting. I have done the trains though, and they are one of the mo most unique and interesting things about going to Japan. Absolutely. The trains are always on time, which is really cool and fun yeah. if you're running late it's not cool or fun <laughs> no, if you're on time it's very cool and very fun but they are also frequent which is good if you're running yes. late <laughs> absolutely and one of the reasons i love to take the bullet train in japan is because you can get the the rail pass so as a foreigner mm -hmm. have you ever done that i have yeah you can get an all you can ride jr rail pass jr stands for japan railroad i think and you can get a pass that lets you take any train except for a very few exceptions, and you can just ride wherever you want to, and you just show this magic pass, and they'll let you through the gate, and you can yeah, get on any train you want to. It's, it's fantastic. And Japanese people are always jealous of the tourists who have this magic pass to get on any train. <laughs> They're like, wow, what is that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a really great way to promote tourism and to help foreigners who, like, you know, would... would maybe be a little nervous about spending uh, to go to places in Japan that they maybe hadn't been before. This is like, well, no, it's included. Just go. And yeah. it really encourages that kind of thing. It encourages experimenting with different parts of the country, which I think that a lot of people go to Japan. They have like maybe one or two places that are stereotypical. It's like, oh, these are the places you go to in Japan. And then they don't go anywhere else. But yeah. being like, hey, here's this pass. It's, you know, you're, if you're going to go, if you're going to go from Tokyo to Kyoto and back, that the price of that, by itself, pays for the pass. So it you, totally does, yeah. Yeah. So why not go everywhere else while you're out there? Yeah. It's great. It's wonderful. Yeah. I don't think Akita is high on the list for many <laughs> tourists who might be taking their first trip to Japan. They want to go to Kyoto or they want to you know, see Mount Fuji or something like that. Sure. But people who maybe have been there a few times and they're looking for a different experience. I've even heard that there's farmer homestays where instead of staying in a hotel, uh -huh. You can stay with a farming family and they'll put you up in their house and they'll cook for you that evening. It's like a little homestay hostel type of thing. That sounds really great to me. They'll tell you about, no? I don't know if it's my style. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. You get to meet the locals and you get to stay in a farmhouse and... I no, think that's, that, cool. that's the part that I wasn't wild about, <laughs> staying in the farmhouse. <laughs> John, are you five-star luxury all the way? <laughs> no, I'm not I five star luxury so. all the way, but there's a I'm just a little shy about farms sometimes. That's all. Oh, that's I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> you know, all this talk about Akita is making me crave Akita sake. Well, uh, I hope you brought some because I did. Oh, <laughs> I've got Akita sake, too. Ah, look at that. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, John, what Akita sake did you bring to taste today? I brought Akita bare. Shunsetsu, which they call the spring snow. And this is, Tim, this is interesting. This is a Nama Honjozo. Yeah. And it seems a little exciting. A little different from my usual sake. I don't think it's going to be as fragrant as my usual selections. See, so guys, I can branch out. Yeah, it is a Honjozo Nama. The Semai Boy is 62% is very interesting it's a very unusual uh, number and the rice type is called gin no se which is something a little bit local what about you i have a very interesting sake the brand name is amanoto 
Amanoto. Amanoto. Okay. This is a Tokubetsu Junmai. This is from Akita. And the rice is also Gin no Se. Hey, you don't say. And our rice milling is 55%. And the Nihon Shudo, that measurement of sweet to dryness, is a plus four. So mm -hmm. I expect a very uh, lightly dry body. And an acidity of 1.5, so very middle of the road for the acidity as well. Uh, my Nihon Shudo is plus two, and acidity is 1.4, so <laughs> we're not venturing far from one another here. Yep. And the English name for the sake that I have, Amanoto, they call it Heaven's Door. Ooh. All right. Uh, that's yeah. nice. Uh, and as I had mentioned, mine is Spring Snow. All right. I don't know. Does it get cold enough in Akita that there's snow in the spring? <laughs> I think there's snow in the spring. Well, there I, you go. I think they named it that from experience. <laughs> well, I imagine they would know better than we do. All right. So I'm curious about yours. So why don't you go first? All right. Let me open this up. So right off the bat, the aroma is not at all what I was expecting. I thought I was going to get almost nothing from this because because of its Honjozo Nama nature. Well, I guess some Nama should have clued me in that there would be a lot more of aroma, but I wasn't thinking about that. It's actually a little bit fruity. This reminds me just a tiny bit of how I felt about the aroma on a Yamagata Hanjozo that we had in a previous episode from Gasanru, where there is some restrained fruit on it. It's not overwhelming, but it is very fresh, and it's got that almost like almost that light fruity dish and like little fresh cut grass a little bit. Very nice. Mm. And then I taste it. This is very interesting. This is very unique. I don't think I've had a sake that tasted uh, exactly like this before. It's extremely light. And it's got a nice little finish that's got some sharpness on it. Nice little dry finish. Yeah, this is a really nice, like, warm day sake. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just saying that because I'm in my apartment with the air conditioning off. <laughs> in well, August. <laughs> well, I think the Honjozo Nama unpasteurized combination is something that's really rare. It's yeah. It's not common at all. Not, not in the least. And yeah. this, it's just very, like, it's smooth and crisp and it has a nice little dry finish to it. I... Really, I'm, I'm really liking this. I, I didn't know what to expect going in. I've not had the sake before. And I'm really enjoying it. Tim, what about your Amanoto O? All right. So I'm going to open this up. All right. And we're going to pour. All right. What do you have there? This is going to sound strange, but it actually smells a little spicy. Okay. A little peppery or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, not overt. It smells very good, but it instead of being floral or fruity, it feels like it's a little bit savory or spicy. Mm -hmm. A very gentle aroma. It's not uh, very overt. It's more restrained. Kind of a light aroma. And let's give it a taste. So it's definitely dry. And there's a back note of earthiness here. There's a little bit of umami. Mm -hmm. And it, it tastes like a little bit of cooked rice or steamed rice. There's a ricey note on the palate. There's a little bit of umami. Uh, there's a bit of fullness to it. But it's all handled with a very uh, deft hand, a very nice balance to it. But instead of being, you know, fruity or floral, this is more ricey. And I think from 
the kingdom of beautiful sake that is so famous for their rice, this is a very good representative sake, I think. When I envision Akita sake, I think of something that is very similar to this profile. It's been a long time since I've had this sake, so it's really fun to revisit it. Nice. This is um, <laughs> really thoroughly enjoying this. The more I sip on it, it's kind of building and changing a little bit as I have more of it, or at least you know, my perception of it does change. And like it's, <laughs> I totally understand why they're calling this spring snow now. It's so just light and delicate and and it's you know when i hear about snow with it i now i'm like oh yeah i can totally associate this with snow it's very light and chill <laughs> mm -hmm. well i've read a few things about the brewery i'm tasting here today mm -hmm. the brewery name is asamai asamai brewery asamai okay. yeah amanoto is the brand name it was founded in 1917 and they are a rice growing brewery. So the rice used to make the sake is actually grown by the brewery. And, you know, in the wine world, estate grown grapes are pretty common where the winemaker is going to grow their own fruit. But what a lot of people don't know about Japan is that most sake brewers do not grow their own rice. So this is kind of the exception. Are there some laws regarding growing your own rice and, and the rice and needing to buy from rice growers? I think what you're thinking of, there's a law that the rice has to be graded before you use it. So you don't necessarily have to buy it from somebody else, but there's mm -hmm. this organization in Japan called the JA. It's a cooperative that grades the rice. So by law, sake rice must be graded before it's sold. So uh, needs to go through this grading process. But as a sake producer, you are allowed to grow your own rice. Okay. So it's not against the rules, but the rice has to be graded. All right. Uh, and mine, the Akita Bare, the name of the brewery is just Akita Bare Brewing Company. And apparently on one of their labels, there is a phrase, uh, Koshigi Junsukuri which is the old way. And so apparently that's kind of the, the thought process and the philosophy of this, of this brewery is to kind of do things in the old way. They don't really do a lot of modernization. They try to do things as traditionally as possible. And they do, you know, small trade-offs apparently here and there. But I think that, you know, a company making a, a Hanjozo Nama is, is probably doing things a little bit old fashioned. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I'm retasting mine again. I'm retasting the Amanoto Tokubetsu Junmai and the rice as it's warming up just a little bit in the glass. The rice flavors are coming forward even more. Mm. So, but it does not lose its balance. It is still so balanced and delicious, but the savoriness of that rice is coming out a little bit more. Really delicious. This is not usually the type of sake that I go to automatically. Mm -hmm. As you know, I like really clean, crisp, and light sakes. This has much more depth than that. But thinking of the sake producers, the brewers at Amanoto also growing the rice, it makes perfect sense that they want to brew a sake in a style that showcases that rice and almost like puts a frame around that rice flavor and says, this is what we're about. And it's so cool to taste that in the glass and like know that the people who brewed this sake also made the rice and you can really taste it. It's just fascinating. I have been to some sake breweries, obviously none in Akita, that grow their own rice. And one of the things that they get out of that, at least that they had to say to us, was that for them creating sake begins in the rice field and so mm. they're cultivating that rice with a specific intent and if they want to make a sake that's going to have a specific end taste in mind they're going to start by making sure that the rice they're growing is getting xyz nutrients mm. and not having abc nutrients in order to make the you know shape the shimpaku in a specific way and mm. make the sake 
the way they want to without having to work so hard to do it, without having to mill so much, so to speak. Which I always thought was very interesting. Yeah. You know, a lot of families in Japan out in the country, they may have a little plot of land or a little paddy, and families in rural Japan often might grow one or two paddies of rice just for their own consumption. Just like, you know, in the U.S., you might have a garden out back and you might grow some vegetables. But I think a lot of sake brewers, the master brewers who make sake, are so interested in their craft and so dedicated to their craft that they study the art of rice growing as well. I know several master brewers who also grow rice on the side. <laughs> Maybe not to supply their whole brewery, mm -hmm. but they so want to study those intricacies of rice that you were talking about, how to get the shimpaku a certain size or how to create the best rice they can for their particular sake. So it really taps into the craftsman culture of Japan. Craftspeople mm -hmm dedicate themselves so fully <laughs> in Japan to whatever they're doing. If it's making sake or ikibana, flower arranging, or whatever they're doing, they really dedicate themselves heart and soul, don't they? They do. And I think it's interesting and it's a testament to uh, the way that they, kind of the way they see things, the way they do things, the way they think that should be done. Hmm. I think this is interesting that you and I, so these, the way we're describing these sakes and the way that we're experiencing them seems to be you know, quite different. And these sakes are made with the same rice from the same prefecture. Mm. And these are quite different. Like, you know, yours your, yours is coming off very earthy. And mine is this dry, crisp, just extremely light sake. Well, one thing that could explain that, John, is that yours is an alcohol-added style mm -hmm. sake. And mine is a Junmai pure rice style. Mm. So that's one thing that I think layers a little bit of difference on the styles of sake that we have. Right. And this is also, as mentioned earlier, this is unpasteurized, whereas yours has presumably been yep. pasteurized twice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I really am finding myself just in love with this sake. It's so good. And it is not my usual style, but it is something really nice about it. I couldn't agree more. I'm having the same reaction to my sake, this kind of ricey, but balanced sake. This is not my usual style, but it is really fun and super enjoyable. And it just, it is uh, so flavorful that there's just a lot to savor when you sip it. Really delicious. As this one warms up, getting a little bit of rice on this end. Hmm. Not like a, not overwhelming, not like, just, you know, <laughs> not Niigata levels of riciness. As I, I always say that, and people that love Nagata Sake always tell me I'm wrong. But very, like, you know, I think you used the phrase once that I really enjoyed that was, someone has a bowl of steamed rice in the other room. <laughs> Wafting. <laughs> Wafting that's rice like the, aromas. The flavor version of that. <laughs> it's a, just a very subtle hints of that steamed rice. Very nice stuff, though. This is, this is very much exceeding my expectations for it. That's fantastic. Well, John, I, I think there's no doubt about it. Akita is on our to-do list, isn't it? <laughs> We're never going to finish. We're never going to get done. Although, you know, you know, once they allow us to go back to Japan, I'll do an episode in every prefecture in the country. I don't care. I want to have a good time. I want to go back. I want to enjoy all of the local sake. I want to go to all of the local izakayas. I'll even visit a few breweries with you. <laughs> well, John, you know what I want to do? I want to take you to a farmer's homestay <laughs> hostel. And we'll do an episode from the Akita countryside interviewing Ma and Pa farmer from rice farmer from Akita. How about that? Oh, OK. So it's only rice farming. These farms that they're going to is just rice? No, there's all kinds of farms. But we'll go to, we'll oh, go okay. to a rice right. farm homestay. <laughs> We can get all of our rice questions answered in one one in episode, one, in, all in one shot. All right, good. And and I'll can I run my hands through some ginose, and uh, that'll be a nice bookend for this episode. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we, we're our to do list for future episodes is growing longer and longer, growing longer and longer, and subject to this pandemic subsiding. But we're gonna get there. We're all gonna get there. I have a lot of hope for the future. I am not feeling down. We're going to be in Japan before we know it. That's right. So 
Akita was really enjoyable, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, our virtual tasting tour. Yes, it was wonderful. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Akita, and I hope all of our listeners out there will try Akita sake really soon. I definitely need to get out there one of these days. Well, thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. We really hope you are enjoying our show. If you'd like to show your support for Sake Revolution, one way to really help us out would be to take a couple minutes and leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. It's one of the best ways for you to help us to get the word out about our show. That's right. And if you can't do that, make sure you tell a friend and then subscribe and then tell your friend to subscribe. This is how we get a lot of people subscribing. Uh, subscribe wherever you download your podcasts. And then every week when we release a new episode, it will magically show up on your device of choice because we don't want you to miss an episode. You don't want to miss an episode. You don't want your friend to miss an episode. So subscribe and you won't. And as always, to learn more about any of the topics or the sakes we talked about in today's episode, just visit our website at sakerevolution.com for all the detailed show notes. And if you have burning sake questions that you need answered, we want to hear from you. Reach out to us at feedback at sakerevolution.com so that you can hear your question answered on the air. So until next time, please remember to keep drinking all that sake and kapai! kapai.